I just get like a couple. I got a funny story. <laughs> do, do you have to stay in the United States? Humble folks. These are these are not humble folks. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Um, for me, actually, I was always um, interested in math. Um, I did uh, put it on the back burner because I thought that it was for other people. I don't know. I'm not really sure why I would think that. Um, so it, it took me a while to realize that, oh, I've been taking math classes this whole time. Maybe I should actually <laughs> look at math more seriously as a, as a profession. Um, and for me, it was super important to have um, mentors and women mathematicians who were a couple of years ahead of me in school, for instance, who I saw that they were doing uh, things that I understood and that I thought I could do as well, and that was a huge revelation for me. What is the most exciting thing for you doing this research? Um, the most exciting thing is honestly just talking to other people and being involved in the community. Um, as basic as that sounds, I never thought that I could be a person in science that was contributing. Uh, so on a very basic level, that part is really exciting for me. So you've attended the lectures both days. Is there something you got out from it? Did you enjoy it? Um, yep. Yeah. Uh, this particular conference was very focused on nonlinear differential equations, which is what I'm studying. So this was a, a particular opportunity for me to listen to lectures from people that are also researching similar things, as opposed to a more general conference where there's a lot of different topics in math in general. But this is really a focused conference, so I got quite a lot out of the, the lectures. So uh, talk to us more about the details about your project. So as I said before, I'm studying nonlinear differential equations. And we're picturing an optical beam traveling perpendicular into the page here on any one of these dots. Those are where the beam can travel. And so there's a particular sort of complicated differential equation here. Um, but in particular, what we were studying is what happens when you have these little oscillations in the t variable or the time variable. And so what's happening is that as you go into the page, there's a little oscillation in the nonlinear term. So it's it was thought, or it was observed in some other cases that were actually not in the, this is the discrete case here, and what were, were studied in the past was the continuous case. So we're studying in particular the, the discrete case on the discrete grid here. And we wanted to try to observe some of these localized structures to see if indeed this oscillation in the time variable would give us the localized st structures. And so this is what uh, the poster is about here. So what you end up doing is taking this uh, oscillating term and you do an averaging procedure so that you just get the average of the oscillations. And actually you can see that uh, coming into play in, in a picture like this where the unaveraged equation is sort of oscillating right th like this but the average is cutting right through it. So we have this little averaging procedure where I spell out um, all of the details of how the averaging works. And then we find these little localized uh, structures. And then what we do is we ask the question about whether these are going to be stable over time. Like as time moves forward, does it stay localized like this? Does it stay as a single coherent structure or does it dissipate over time? So we spe spelled out some of the details here about when it's stable and when it's not stable. Is there a conclusion or an end game for this when you discover it? Um, it's basically an ongoing type of interaction, right? So this is like a preliminary type of result. And what we would want to see is some conversation with something like a, a physicist who's doing some experiments where they can actually observe it in the lab. Um, and once they observe something, they might come back to us and say, you know, we saw this weird phenomenon that you didn't really describe in your equations. What do you think about that? Can you, you, know, can, can you account for that in your equations? So there's a back and forth uh, between the physics and the math. As a woman mathematician, how important is it for you to be able to support fellow mathematicians and students? Um, it's very important to me. It was really crucial for my own success to see other women in mathematics, uh, fellow students who were ahead of me, that really motivated me to understand that I can do this profession, and that was really crucial for my own success. Uh, so I feel a big responsibility to be present and to be um, in the community and talking to people uh, because that was part of my own success. I feel that it's important to be um, a visible person as well as a hardworking person. Great. Well, thank you very much for talking with us today. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Hey, my name is Stefan Shipman. I'm a professor of mathematics at Louisiana State University. 
and I've been there for about 12 years. I work on problems in mathematical physics, uh, mostly problems coming from electromagnetics and having to do with resonance and uh, things that people call, photo call photonic crystals and also going into um, things like graphing. Um, that's, that's been a hot topic these days in, in physics. So is there a reason why graphing is a hot topic? Well, graphing is a hot topic. Um, it's, it's kind of a technical issue, but it's a hot topic because of some of the, 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 the structure, the, the hexagonal structure that's a kind of a stable sort of structure for, that allows electrons to propagate through it as if it were propagating through free space, which is not possible in most kinds of periodic structures. So why is it important for you to study this area? Is it something that people have not done before? Is it something new or is it something old that you're discovering new things? Oh. Well, I'm interested in particular, particular uh, types of problems that involve not only graphene but other types of periodic structures and uh, specifically having to do with resonance. And so I study a lot of problems where you have some kind of homogeneous medium that, where waves can propagate, but there's a, there's a defect somewhere in that structure. And because of that defect, you can trap energy at particular frequencies. Okay, and this also happens in graphene. And so that's the reason why I'm studying graphene, because of this particular um, type of resonance that, that people apparently have found in physics. So that's the kind of thing I'll, I'll tell you about here. <laughs> so go ahead and introduce us what your research is on. Well, um, the motivation for this particular uh, poster here comes from a physics paper that I, I found that claims to have, see this is a picture of graphene here. It's, it's actually two layers of a hexagonal structure coupled together by these, by these lines which indicate this kind of a, a potential coupling between the two. But they claim to have created a kind of defect in that uh, bilayer graphene that's able to trap energy and that where that energy can actually interact with radiation. That, that propagates out infinitely. If you think about this as continuing, continuing infinitely in all directions, right? So this kind of interaction between trapping energy right here and radiation, okay, in, in that structure. And so I wanted to f try to understand the mathematics behind that because these are the kind of things I'm interested in um, mathematically. And so one of the first things I looked at, well, I, there's, there's a lot of work by Peter Kutschmann and Boris um, uh, Weinberg, and they have a theorem that's basic, it's a mathematical theorem that basically says that can't happen, okay? Yet there's these physics papers that claim it does happen. But there's, there's a catch to it, and that catch is that there's a certain algebraic part of the whole problem that, that's um, it's associated with the propagation of waves in these structures, and it says that if a certain property is true about, you know, algebraically, um, then you can't have this kind of situation that I just described. But it turns out that <coughs> there, there <coughs> I, what, what this poster is about is certain types of special um, interesting classes of, of periodic structures where that catch actually doesn't hold. So this algebraic structure, this algebraic property, which, which technically has to do with um, the irreducibility of a certain algebraic surface. That's technically what it is. But there are certain structures where I find, well, it actually is reducible, so therefore this theorem does not apply. And it turns out that you really can find a mathematical way to describe this kind of resonance that, that people were seeing um, in, in the physics literature. So, big deal in physics, big deal in mathematics. How can you show that it's important for, for the layman to understand the importance of this? Well, okay, I don't actually have the answer to that completely yet. And so, w uh, what I do understand, it, well, I don't even understand the physics very well either yet, but um, the graphene has, has lots of interesting um, properties that, that, that people um, care about. And so, and, and as I said before, one of the interesting properties of graphing is how electrons can travel through it as if it were free space. And uh, this interaction with, with, uh, with resonance is, um, I don't know exactly how people are going to use it in graphing, but the, the resonance between radiation that we will have here 
and this trapped energy is actually used in lots of photoelectronic devices. Okay? So I can't say anything specific about that in the relation to graphene, but that's the way I think about these problems. And then my role here, I think of my role as really trying to understand carefully what the mathematics behind it is. Okay, and then eventually I'll understand some of the physics better. Okay, great. And so I just want to talk to you about what did you think about the lecture today? How did you hear about it? Is it, you know, school between school type of relationship? Uh, yes, well, my connection, I got in, invited to just participate um, by the organizers and probably because I was a collaborator with Michael Weinstein and one paper at some point that <laughs> we did up in Banff. So I guess I just, wanted to, I just wanted to get an idea, you know, how, how was the lecture like, what, what did you get out from it type of thing? Lectures. Oh, th these are experts on some of the it's really beautiful mathematics that, that Michael Weinstein works with. Um, and, you know, I, I, I wish I could keep up with all of it, but, but there's always something that I get out of each, each one of those lectures that I look for one thing that I can kind of keep and, and, and do something with. As a, as a professor, as a, as a scientist, math mathematician, um, how important do you think it is for students and professors to have this kind of resource available? Oh, it's, it is absolutely indispensable. I mean, all of the collaborations that I have, pretty much all of them came from going to conferences and talking to people, and especially this kind of a conference where, where it's not so big. We have a, a smaller group of people all interested in uh, ideas that, that, are, that are sort of um, the same. We're all interested in these ideas and we basically all of us understand what's going on in the talks. Not all the details, but, but we're interested and we can talk together and get to know each other and what we, what, what we do. Hi, uh, so my name is Eric Stachura. I'm a fifth year graduate student at Temple University and my advisor is Christian Gutierrez. So my research involves problems in geometric optics and electromagnetism. And so that's what I would like to talk about today. And in particular, one phenomenon in electromagnetism known as negative refraction. So uh, negative refraction is a phenomenon in which uh, light is bent in an opposite way to what is expected classically. And so there are materials that possess this phenomenon, but not in nature. And the theory behind the infinite materials were developed by a Russian physicist in the 1960s, but for more than 30 years, nobody thought too much into it because these materials were not constructed yet. But then in the early 2000s, somebody at the University of California finally constructed one of these materials in the laboratory, and uh, ever since then, the research for these materials has grown tremendously. So there are many applications, and one of the things that I'm interested in are the mathematical aspects of these materials in particular studying um, refraction and refra reflection with these materials. Um, how, did you, how did you get interested in it? Was there a particular reason that you decided to go into this area? So it was over coffee one day, my advisor just mentioned this, this thing he had thought about recently. This was maybe a year or two ago. And he said, oh, maybe you should look into this. And I looked into it and started reading some of these physics papers. And I was like, well, this is actually very interesting. Maybe we can actually do something with this. And my advisor has done lots of optics problems, but not with these strange new materials. And I thought, OK, maybe it would be worthwhile to, expl uh, to explore these materials. And we did. And we found out there, there's a lot of new things here that are very interesting. And for me, one of the more interesting things are the applications of these materials that people have found. Uh, for example, there are two main applications, such as including uh, invisibility cloaking which is actually becoming a really real big topic these days, and also uh, for imaging. So in principle, these materials could be used to image objects at the smallest level. For example, how if scientists want to image a virus or bac bacteria, how are you supposed to image that with a regular microscope? You can't. But in principle, if you use these materials, then you should be able to, uh, to look at these objects at the smallest level. So what's the importance of that? You, you talk about invisible cloaking, very Harry Potter. Um, very good. So what is why is that important to apply to real life? Invisibility cloaking could be could have many military uses, and uh, optical imaging is very important for all kinds of scientists, whether they're working in nanotechnology or in any other technology. If you want to image objects at the very very smallest level to actually see what's going on and get a better understa understanding, for example, actually looking at DNA with the naked eye would be a fantastic application for scientists. 
But uh, so I haven't done any of that. One of the problem that I'm working on is constructing a surface mathematically that separates basically two medium, such as air, and one of these new materials, sometimes called metamaterials, such that if you take any light source in the air and you want to construct the surface so that every light ray that you shoot is refracted into a single point in your new material. So we construct the surface mathematically and see what it looks like and discuss all kinds of properties about it. And the surface is given by a very simple equation, actually. It's just the absolute value of x plus kappa times the distance from the point that you're trying to illuminate from x is equal to b. So when this number kappa is the ratio of the two indices of refraction of the media, when this number is positive, this, these surfaces are very well known. They're convex. And this is expected when you have lenses, when you're constructing lenses. But now, this number kappa is negative in our situation, and so these surfaces are no longer convex and maybe shaped strangely. And so we can see here that they're, at some point they are convex, but at some point they start to wrap around the target that you're trying to illuminate, and so stop being convex. From the picture, this is nice to see and everything, but we're mathematicians, so we want to have a proof of this. And so our theorem says that exactly, well, exactly some of the time the, the surfaces are convex, and the other times, yeah, they are not convex, and this is what we prove. So do you have a next step after this? Uh, yes, yeah, so in doing so, we actually developed a vector form of Snell's law. Snell's law you learn in high school physics. So my advisor has developed a vector form for classical materials, and we pushed this further to, the, to uh, incorporate these negative refractive index materials. But now we would like to push this even further to see, to study more sophisticated um, materials, such as photonic crystals or bi-anisotropic materials. So what did you think about the lecture today? What did you get out from it? And have you, have you done something like this before? Do you like it? Uh, I think the first lecture today was fantastic because I'm interested in problems b at the boundary between mathematics and physics. And sometimes mathematicians and physicists don't really speak the same language. So I'm really excited to see that mathematicians are trying to work and work with physicists and understand rigorous mathematics and understand physical phenomena from that, from that perspective. My name is David Trubatch from Montclair State University, and I'm investigating uh, uh, pulses in uh, light pulses in um, in optical fibers. Uh, this is a subject of a lot of interest. Uh, optical fibers are used as the backbone of the internet. They're used in other kind of communications. Uh, they're used in other kinds of uh, devices. So when pulses get very short, uh, standard models that people have been using for a long time don't work. So there's a relatively new model called, for obvious reasons, the short pulse equation that describes these extremely short pulses. One property of the equation that people have discovered is that the solutions can break apart uh, even if you start with a nice smooth initial wave. Uh, this is important because it means the model is broken down and we need to use a different model or, or, or make a different adaptation. However, it's not always clear when they break down. So what I've been investigating is trying to find out precisely what kind of solutions break apart, when they break apart, and how they break apart. So what we do is we put, a, put the model into a computer and we simulate the solution over time. Now just looking at it, you can't tell by just looking at it how it breaks apart. You have to use um, some, a little bit of mathematics. So what you look at is we break the signal into all of its constituent frequencies. So it, it, every one pulse is made up of several different frequencies at once. And we look at how much power is in each frequency. And the rate that the power falls off is an indicator of whether the wave is breaking. And when a wave is breaking, what happens is its power spreads to all the frequencies. And so what we, what we do is we measure the power in all the frequencies and we monitor it over time and try to see if we can detect the breaking. So this is the idea of the method. Um, this method's been used for other, other systems, and I'm adapting it to this equation because it's, a, it's an important model. So what I did first was I looked at this, this complicated equation here is the equation of a known solution, and if you do the algebra and the carefully, you can figure out exactly where the breaking is supposed to happen. And what we showed is by using this method that I talked about, we can actually match the predicted with the uh, exact results uh, with a f few digits of accuracy without too much trouble. So then, knowing that the method worked, we took it to another solution, which is a more general interest of a, a basic pulse, and we again predicted we uh, again use the same method, and by using that method, we, uh, we predict that some solutions will break and some solutions won't. So there's, a, there's a, a value A in this formula which measures how steep the initial solution is. And what we see from our experiments, let me show you here, 
these these lines measure the the uh, um, uh, closeness to breaking, and when the line goes down to zero, that means the wave is breaking. And what we see is that as we increase the value of a, all of a sudden the waves start to break. And in fact, as we increase the a even more, so we make the wave more steep, it breaks even sooner. So by using this method, we've been able to see exactly when a break will happen with high accuracy, and we actually can see the trend where, where steeper waves break faster. Uh, so this shows that um, we now have a better handle on, 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 on that kind of phenomenon, and we're now ready to apply uh, a more sophisticated model so we can investigate exactly what happens when it breaks and make a more precise physical prediction. So tell us why is it important to have this kind of prediction? Well, so the short pulse equation models these very short pulses which have a, a lot of uh, potential applications in uh, relatively sophisticated devices that do things like uh, timing or they uh, generate uh, highly accurate measurements. And so we need to have a, a good handle on what kind of pulses we could actually use. Or the next step is we want to have a good handle on if pulses break apart, what's going to happen? So uh, that actually, uh, a pulse breaking apart can be a good thing because, as I said before, when you when a pulse breaks apart, you get energy in across all the frequencies. That's called a wide band frequency, or um, it's called supercontinuum. It's also sometimes called supercontinuum generation. It's a big word, and people want to have devices where they can generate a very a very large array of frequencies. So we're we are making um, being able to we're building the system so that people can make more clear predictions so that it'll help them build these kinds of devices. So is there a practical application to your research or is it more theoretical? There, there are practical applications. Uh, there's some distance between the practical applications and what I'm doing, but there are definitely points in that direction. So uh, the kinds of devices and technologies are not kind of something that you would buy for your house, but they're for making high precision instruments and high precision measurements of the kind that uh, people, um, uh, engineers would use. So and uh, possibly some medical devices. So, so there are applications, but they're, um, they're not, they're not, this is not going to be in your home uh, next year. So tell us a little bit about your background and how you got interested in mathematics. Okay, well, both my uh, parents were scientists, so I always grew up uh, around science, and I was very interested in uh, doing science and in mathematics. Uh, but then uh, I discovered that I wasn't so good in the laboratory. I had a lot of trouble doing experiments, so uh, doing mathematics is a, is a way to study these kinds of things without um, getting dirty or breaking things. Great. Well, thank you very much for talking with us today. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, I'm Christy Guevara. I'm a postdoc at Louisiana State University in the math department. I graduated from Arizona State University and originally from Colombia, and I did my PhD in nonlinear dispersive equations. I did my dissertation work was on nonlinear Schrodinger equation on the mass supercritical energy subcritical. And I did some scat uh, showing some scattering, basically trying to under understand how the solutions of the nonlinear Schrodinger behave behave in, in certain regime and for any dimensions. And also, I look some blow ups so results on those ones. Um, what I'm basically working right now, I've been working on fluids on non parties on porous media and I'm also looking on, uh, and right now I'm working on uh, looking at the behavior of the nonlinear dispersive equation as, as still, but also working on fluids on, not this, on porous media and uh, doing some problems on fractals and trying to see diffusion of fractals. Basically what I chose to do my poster on, it was like a Roland-Dow equation, but it, it really, uh, usually, whenever you hear about Gerstmann Landau, you hear about nonlinear uh, equations. You hear about no optics. Um, sometimes you use uh, pattern recognition, and that's whenever probably uh, our interest on in this equation came from. I spent some time in Mexico, and in Mexico is a big city, and it's a really, a really awful traffic. So this is a rush hour. And uh, there was this project they, by the city, and they were trying to find out ways to control the traffic. Um, the group at, uh, at the institution I was working at, they did a really big work on understanding this problem, trying to model, and there are a couple of um, ways to do it. One is looking at from the macroscopic point of view. Basically, you look at the 
traffic and you think, oh, this is a fluid and it's an uncompressible fluid, so let's try this as a fluid. But you also can go take the car and you start follow the, the car and try to see what happened with the car and how the, the car goes and try to understand and get the model from there. Or basically uh, on the interaction with other cars. Or basically just pick one of the cars and start doing it. So we, they were working on this type of problems and trying to understand. And the question was, well, what is the connection between all the, those models? So we start uh, kind of exploring and like we came up with the, we have to kind of do some parent recognition and we came up with the girls for Landau equation. That was a good question to us. It's an linear equation. Um, it's a canonical to this, uh, to describe any nonlinear behavior. So we say, well, why wh we don't look for that? So that's whatever we came to. So, and basically, most of the getting the follow up in the car, we did the, like, let's think about this is a, a fluid and compressible fluid. It's a chemical Hauser model, that's the name of for that, and the cellular autonomy. So, basically, take one car and try to look and try to be the connection of that one. So, that's how we came up with the Kurzweil and Dowell question. So, you, you have so many ways to do it. It's a complex, so basically we separate those complex numbers, like, like the pure imaginary and the pure real, get the, the whole thing and get the behavior from that one. It's kind of kind of complicated. So let's say, well, let's just keep it simple and let's try to do that. Uh, we kind of get something for the real part and then we get something for the pure part and maybe we can combine some. Many ways to do it. So talking about uh, my work on the, and, and somehow uh, related with the uh, Dr. Weinstein's work is just trying to look at the thresholds, how the behavior of the solution goes. So that is a scattered way. That's our main goal, trying to do that way. But uh, before doing that, we are trying to do it in a dynamical system way. How, what it that mean? So we get a solution, we try to get uh, we plug it into the equation and we try to see what kind of type of solutions we get from that. Uh, basically, so we get these answers and we start looking for traveling ways. And try, uh, this is my answers and trying to see if I can get a Lagrangian and, and what kind of information we can get. The good thing is that if we get some, this is my equation and if I get all these delta, the Greek letters, make it equals to zero. So we end up with the basically nonlinear Schrodinger equation, a quint cubic quintic, and, and well, and there are some work done. It was an, a back in the 82, uh, they showed that there is a, t a shallow wave and we can get some information of those waves. What does that mean? There are some, um, solid information and some homoclinical isolation. So the first idea was let's, let's try to prove this, uh, take this information that we have uh, from these dynamical systems and try to see if we can get that from the Gersberg Landau. It was kind of obvious way to do it and we actually got that information. So now whatever it w we want to do is just let's try to see uh, if we have any type of uh, bifurcations and what kind of in for bifurcation we have. And also like uh, try to make some connection with those solitons that probably make and then try to see if we can get some scattering on some blow ups on this solution. And then let's go back to our model and then try to, well, that's a kind of big goal and crazy goal. If we can try to see, give some ideas of how to avoid this kind of behaviors that present on the was there was there a particular reason you decided to go into traffic? Actually, the university got a grant, so they were uh, they they got a grant like a couple of years ago, probably like eight years ago, and they were working on the uh, solving the metro system in, in Mexico. Okay, because that that's a pretty universal problem, no matter where you go. So, is this something that you can apply to anywhere once you once you yeah. reach a solution? Mm. It's not that, well, it depends also the infrastructure of the, the city, but uh, it will solve at least the problem in Mexico City or big cities like in Chicago or New York. And actually this Kenny Conhauser problem uh, model came uh, from the problem in the Lincoln Bridge here in New York. So that's, that's the main idea. 
Great. And so uh, did you enjoy the lecture today? What did you take out from it? I really enjoy it. Uh, it is so much um, beautiful map there, uh, going there. It's a great work that they have done, and I just love it. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate you talking with us today. Okay, perfect. Thanks. Hello, my name is Claudia Castro. I'm a graduate student at Southern Methodist University. Um, my advisor is Alejandro Aceves, and I have been working on nonlinear waves, solitons, road waves, and recently on optics, light localization. So tell us a little bit about your research. Well, um, I have been trying to study the localization of light uh, when traveling through optical wave guide arrays in care media, this basically means that you can relate the index of refraction of the light with the intensities of the light waves. And we are trying to approach this problem by using discrete nonlinear Schrodinger equation to model this phenomenon. And we uh, use numerical methods to solve this and explore the different behaviors of light. So why are, why are you doing this? What's the importance of this, of this research? Well, the idea of this research um, is try to get a powerful laser beam out of many smaller ones, so you can get a light traveling really long distances. This was some um, summer work I did, um, and uh, this is a relatively new topic for me. Um, I was trying to switch my um, research area, and then I found out this uh, problem. I thought it was very interesting. What's the most interesting aspect of it for you? Um, the fact of you can are able to simulate things and solve problems through the computer. So, um, so tell us a little bit about your research. Well, I study the propagation of light through optical wave guide arrays. Specifically, we're interested in some arrangements of the optical waveguides. For example, square arrangements of optic fibers like this one, or disorder optical fibers like this one. This is a transversal cut. Um, and we want to study um, the localization of light. That means keeping the light uh, in the center of the, uh, of the fibers so that light does not spread and or fades away. So um, we approach this by using a model uh, called a nonlinear Schrodinger equation, the discrete version of it, and we take two approaches. Um, we consider the optical waveguides being perfectly stacked, perfectly um, aligned, or we consider them there are no manufacturing defects from them, and we also consider a more realistic case when we consider the light, um, I'm sorry, the optical wave guides being, having some defects um, interesting to manufacturing um, processes. So you talk about localizing light and optical fibers. Why is this important to, to know? Is there a practical aspect of this in applied science? Can you talk to us about that? There are some applications of it. Um, for instance, you can think of combining many optical fibers and then get a really pow powerful laser beam out of them. Talk about, talk, uh, sorry, talk to us about um, the Mars rover, how they use the lasers. <laughs> okay, the Mars, Mars rover, what it does, um, it uses a laser beam um, to study the configuration of the surface of Mars. Um, so this laser, when it hits the surface, it sends back some information um, regarding to the composition of the surface. So if the Mars rover is like far away from the surface that it wants to study, it needs to reach out that surface. So that is because of that reason we're interested in sending laser beams to the farthest distance possible. So is, is this something that's more on the science side, or can this be applied to medical or biological or is it commercial? Is this something that people will be able to see in the future? Can you talk a little bit about that? Um, I understand that there are some other applications, like sending signals through um, like internet using optical fibers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So tell us about the lecture today. Did you like it? Did you learn anything from it? What did you think about it? 
Well, I always like to come to conferences like this because I get so um, many ideas out of it. I like to hear all these um, famous people and hear their approaches um, through science. Well, thank you very much for talking with us today. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm Newman Malik. I'm a grad student at Brown University. and. Here I have my poster that depicts uh, what I'm looking into right now for my research. Um, the main idea is that uh, the equation you see here uh, on the left is what's known as the Gross-Pitaevsky equation. And it's very well known in the area of nonlinear optics, which basically studies the behavior of light. And in particular, this equation, I'm looking in um, one dimension where the idea is the equation models the way dark pulses propagate in, uh, in what, what's known as slab waveguides. So uh, my main interest is to see what happens when you add perturbations to special solutions to this equation. So I'm seeing a lot of research on optics today. Mm -hmm. And is there a particular reason why it's important to have that research ongoing? Um, well, I guess in of itself, the mathematics, there's a lot of area to, to explore. Um, my sort of scope is to see how these specials, what, the, what are known as uh, solitons, um, which are, can, can be thought of as localized traveling wave solutions. And in particular, th these are not well understood compared to what are known as bright solitons. Um, and the idea is you have these w traveling waves and you see how stable they are or unstable. And the idea is you, you look at how they propagate through space and the mathematics helps you to understand the dynamics in, say, uh, further down in, in long time, uh, in, in, you know, in the future, basically. Is there a practical aspect to this? We have students that research optics that were was used in the Mars rover, where the lasers were part of their part of their study. Is there a is there something that you can give us that people can relate to? Can this be used commercially? Will people see it? That type of thing. Um, I'll be honest. I haven't thought too much about the commercial applications. All I know is that experimentally, people have looked at numerical sim simulations. So for example, you see the pictures on the poster here. To the left, we have uh, the um, what's known as um, the core of the soliton. It lies within an inner region, whereas the outer region can be shown that is independent of what happens inside. And there, as a result, the what's known as a moving boundary layer sort of helps to manifest a, a sort of shelf that comes to the, the boundaries, the left and the right of the, the soliton. Uh, and, and that in of itself, um, you can see uh, how, how the soliton behaves. Um, but again, uh, in real life applications, uh, I'm sure there are some, but uh, it, it, very little is known about the, in this case, the dark soliton. What got you interested in this area? Well, uh, I mean, uh, I had to read a lot on a lot of literature, see what interested me. Um, uh, initially, what set me on the path was my advisor who told me why these things are of interest, how little is known about it, and you know, these are the results that are, that are available right now, and there's so much more to ex explore. Um, the main difference, of course, being what I mentioned was that for since probably about the 70s, the uh, bright soliton case um, is pretty well understood, um, whereas um, the dark solitons is sort of uh, very much um, uh, under in investigation. Um, and the, the, the sort of the name comes from the fact from nonlinear optics where um, dark solitons uh, in experiments they appear gray for most of the time. Um, and in particular, I'm looking at the black soliton, which is a special solution where it, it's the only one that actually vanishes at one particular point in, in time and space. What's the most exciting aspect for you studying this? Well, I mean, I, for me, it's the theory, the mathematics behind it. Um, the applications are good motivation for studying it. People are interested in w why it's useful. Uh, but for me, it's just the using what I've learned so far um, from you know 
the, the, the classes I've taken uh, dr during my time in studying uh, that, that sort of re really uh, grabs me when it comes to these sorts of problems. So. so tell us about the lecture today. Did you enjoy it? Did you take anything out from it? How was it for you? Uh, it was interesting to see how you know mathematics can be used in uh, a bunch of different uh, ways when it comes to uh, applied situations. Um, for me, in my department, a, a lot of it's just for the sake of mathematics, which is, is great, of course, um, but it's good to see different perspectives on uh, uh, u using this, the study of uh, differential equations. My name is um, Olani Yola. I am from University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee. I am a graduate student there, and I am working on uh, a class of differential equation called fractional differential equation. And that is what I'm presenting here today. So tell us a little bit more detail about your research. Why are you doing it? OK, so everybody wants to uh, make derivative of um, integer order. Uh, for instance, you are making um, second order, third order, and so forth. But you see in application, there are so many models that cannot be captured by uh, the regular integer order um, derivative. And so I, I was a kind of interested to see what will be the derivative, half derivative, half order derivative of, an, of a function, for instance. And uh, I have read a lot and discovered that many uh, physical models, like in um, when you want to model something that has to do with nanotechnology, uh, control problems, especially when you are coming very slow, like uh, some research was done about and cancer tumor, and this kind of thing, you can get better explanation when you give, uh, when you model it with fractional order. So um, what's the practical aspect of this? Is, is this something that people can relate to? Is it going to be applied for something in the future? Yes. Uh, currently, uh, uh, it, it's been applied currently in many fields. Like I said, uh, they use this kind of fractional and uh, derivative for signal processing, those who want to map images on geophysics, use it to do exploration of the of the oil from the oil recovery and so many applications actually in the industry, but not much is known about it. And that's why I'm interested in exploring it. What's the most exciting aspect of doing this research for you? Yeah, what is most important in this research is not just the uh, theoretical part. So people generally prove their systems uniqueness and dependency on the data. But I went for that to make uh, the way we can construct the, f uh, the solution that anybody can make use of it. Actually, the solution is approximate, but we have been able to show that under some conditions, you get a good approximation. And so everybody can have a feeling. So people in engineering and other field can actually work with it, not just to see the, the theoretical proof. So you attended lectures earlier. Is there something that you enjoyed about it? Did you learn something new today? What did you think about it? Yeah, what is exciting actually, like in my poster, I talked a little more about spectra theory application in this field. And uh, actually in the main paper, it was silent because it's assumed that it's generally known. But something that is of importance is how we use spectra theory, the, uh, the eigen functions that we obtain to construct the solution. And that is what you see in, in today's lecture, how the spectra theory is being used in application. Great. Great. Well, thank you very much for talking with us today. Really appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you very much. Uh, so my name is Chileang Wu. I'm a third year postdoc at Michigan State. Uh, I'm working on uh, amphiphytic morphologies. So tell us a little bit about your research. Why is it important? OK, so uh, to start with, uh, so, so the material we're looking at is called amphiphils. Uh, examples are like uh, soap and also uh, lipids, like uh, lipids on cell membranes. And it also has like, well, why we're interested in, in, in doing research of amphiphils is because apparent reasons, right, it's abandoned in biological structures, like lipids, like just I said. And also, uh, we have wide applications, um, such as detergent. And also, um, there are the key in ingredient in uh, electrical membranes in batteries. OK, 
Okay, so it's very important in energy conversion. So how did you get into this? What was your what was your interest? Um, so I always wanted to do math, not just for the math sake. Uh, I wanted to uh, apply what I've learned uh, into some some problems that actually have uh, realistic meanings in, in applications. What's the biggest surprise for you so far? You think? Yeah. Um, so thing is that it's very exciting that when I when I when I start working with my postdoc mentor Keith Promislo, um, is that he actually managed to come up with some, this model so that um, actually we can connect uh, uh, using all the math that I've learned uh, back in my grass, grad school years into actually a really, really rich and realistic problem that actually we, we are able to explain lots of things. So can you explain to us how does the battery apply to your research? Oh, um, so you know that for uh, solo, solo cells, um, a very important uh, part in solo cell is uh, its electrolyte membrane. And if we can better understand amphiphiles, like there are assemblies and a structure formed by amphiphiles, then we can actually, so we hope we can make, make better uh, electrolyte that uh, actually um, uh, to, to make better uh, solo cells. So. so you attended the lectures today. Did you enjoy it? Did you learn something from it? What did you think about it? Oh, it's very nice. Uh, so very nice lectures actually. Um, I actually able to see lots of things that I've done in the past that have applications that's in in lectures. So it's very exciting to see that. Great. Yeah. Well, um, is there anything else that we didn't talk about you'd like to add? Yeah. Um, actually, um, so I want to talk a little bit more about uh, amphiphiles. So amphiphiles um, basically re refers to uh, molecules with uh, hydrophilic head and uh, hydrophobic tail. So uh, it has very unique uh, properties. For example, if you think it's a mixture of just water and oil, then say, well, uh, if you let it sit, then it will automatically uh, phase separation into two regions, water and oil. And uh, they tend to minimize the interface area. But amphiphil, if you add amphiphils into the mixture of water and oil. So if you think about it, you wash your dishes, right? You add soap into the mixture of water and oil. Then you can see that we have lots of bubbles, right? So that actually are indications that actually amphiphils, amph uh, amphiphil amphiphilic mixtures, say actually wanted to increase the interfacial area, okay? And uh, that part comes from the, uh, uh, we call it amphiphilicity. That's the strong, uh, strengthness of the uh, hydro hydrophilic head. And that's one thing that's very important, differ from the, the water and oil mixture. And that's uh, uh, one major play why we have so, so huge applications of, uh, of amphiphils. And the other uh, property of amphiphil is its uh, aspect ratio, its uh, shape of the tail, of the hydrophobic tail, and it actually, it's, uh, it's the shape of the uh, uh, hydrophobic tail is actually f plays a really important role, uh, uh, role in, should I start over? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think I broke no, that's okay, that's okay. Yeah. Do you wanna start with just, uh, we can go straight into aspect ratio? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. So, so um, are you good? Yeah. Okay. So give us a bit more detail about the aspect ratio. So aspect ratio actually plays, uh, is another uh, very important property of amphiphiles. It, uh, it plays very important uh, role in the selection mechanism of which, um, uh, which self-assembly the amphiphil will form into. So um, we have, you can see it here, depending on the shape of amphiphiles, uh, uh, of the uh, hydrophobic tail of amphiphil, we can form into bilayers, uh, 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 hexagonal uh, structures, and micelles. And also, like when we have this bilayer structure, depends on the aspect ratio of amphiphil, it can actually form into uh, a curved or uncurved bilayers. Great. Well, thank you very much for taking the time to talk about this today. We really appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs>